All right, in this video, let's take a look at two real popular, well-built AR-15s. And thanks to the guys at Tucson Guns for giving us a couple of guns off the wall that we can take a look at. First off, we're going to look at a Colt 6920. So this is a 5.56 uh, AR-15 made by Colt, uh, very standard. And we'll take a look at this one compared to this one from Troy Defense, which is also a 5.56 AR-15. But as you can see, comparing the two just side by side, they're quite a bit different. Uh, it might be cosmetically to some people, but let's take a look at mechanically how they're different, uh, why they might come to a different price point. Just as a ballpark, this one's about 1200 and that one's about 1600 and let's take a look at why they're different. First off, when we look at the Colt, we see that it's a, they're both 16 inch barrels. This one is a carbine length gas system with an M4 profile. It's also got standard hand guards. Taking a look at from the back, we've got a standard Colt stock, Colt pistol grip, uh, standard lower receiver, flat top upper, and this one comes with a set of Magpul rear sights and a standard uh, A2 style front post. So again, very standard, similar to what might be issued in the military, of course, in semi-automatic as opposed to full auto. Now on the Troy, we've got a little bit different mechanical stuff going on, different parts. First off, we've got a uh, LMT barrel, 16 inches. It's a government profile, so it's just a you know no M4 cut up front. This one has a uh, low pro gas block at a mid length, so we'll take a look at compared in that. This one has uh, a, a Troy. Uh, we call it a rail, but it's really just a, a free float hand guard. This one also has starting from the back a different style stock. It has the Troy battle axe. It has Troy's version of a pistol grip. Uh, their lower receiver and a flat top upper. It also has the Troy style rear sight. So a lot more real estate uh, for optics or uh, night vision, lights, potentially lasers or other accessories. We've got a very low profile handguard. We have a different gas system, different barrel profile, which isn't a big deal, but it might add some differences to balance. And then a different uh, per point, uh, points of contact with the, with the person, with the shooter with the rubberized kind of oversized stock with the well there's an adjustable uh, it's, it's able to adjust but it's also got this club foot style where you can bring your offhand up to bring it into your shoulder like you would on some of the larger style rifles. Now while the stocks might look different in their shape and their use I suppose uh, they both extend to the same place and they both close in To about the same dimension with a little bit more on this one with the uh, rubber recoil pad. And again it's a different shape but it also offers some different function. Then we've got a, some actual aggressive texturing on the grip which makes a big difference. It's hard to describe in the video but it makes a big difference when you're holding the rifle. Now these aren't necessarily advantages over the standard AR or in this case this Colt. They're just differences and if you're not interested in you know, $150 stock with these features uh, that might not be something you're interested in paying for in your initial purchase. So while this one is definitely set up for a specific type of shooter or specific tastes, it might not be everyone's tastes. And those don't necessarily make them better, just different. They overlooked their muzzle devices. The Colt 6920 comes with a standard A2 style birdcage, they call it, which is perfectly working, you know, works fine as a flash suppressor doesn't really do too much as a muzzle brake, but it also offers the ability for a lot of suppressors to attach. If we look at this one from Troy, I'm not sure if this is their Claymore or something else, but they have their own proprietary brakes. This is more of a brake, I'd call it, than a flash suppressor uh, because of the lack of uh, holes, but honestly there might be some definition I'm not sure of. But basically it's got some aggressive uh, texture on the front for breaking glass, I assume. It's got the uh, cuts in the side, which again, I believe we're going to act as a break, but might be more of a flash hider. Uh, definitely a different style, and because it's a different dimension, it's not going to work with any suppressors that need or require the standard A2. We've looked at some differences. Look at, let's look at some similarities. I believe, uh, just from looking at them, that from all outward appearances, they seem to be standard triggers. Uh, they both have the same magazine release. We flip them over. They both have 
almost identical selectors and their bolt releases are the same as well. So nothing oversized, nothing uh, proprietary or anything there. They're just standard manual of arms. As far as the operation of the sights, they both operate the same way. They, they flip up when you need it. They flip down to get out of the way when you don't need them. The Magpuls, of course, are made out of polymer, where the Troy have a reputation of uh, you know excellence, and they're made out of aluminum. Uh, you can flip it down when you don't need it. It goes right up when you need it. Locks into place. They both come with two diameters uh, for the rear sight. Let's look at charging handles. Uh, as far as I can tell, they're both standard charging handles. Uh, as far as th that means that they're the standard size and shape and the standard release. And I suspect that even though the Troy has some upgrades, that's because people have their own preference on the style and why put one in that costs more when uh, people might change it anyway. So they both operate exactly the same and they're both the same dimensions. Other options would be larger releases or different shaped handles. Now let's compare their four ends again. Again, we've got different length gas systems. So what that tells us is on this one you can kind of see the gas uh, tube that comes up from the gas block, pushes the gas or directs the gas backwards to where it hits the key on the top of the carrier, the bolt carrier. Uh, which then pushes it back and releases all the dirty gas into where it eats. But uh, we can see that the lengths are different and that's going to affect the, the timing. So let's say a round was fired from each firearm at the same time. As the gases expand and the bullets are pushed down the barrel on the carbine length gas system, once the bullet reaches this point, gas is going to be able to escape up through the gas hole and back through the gas tube. Where on the mid-length, it's going to need to travel to this point before the gas can escape and go down the gas tube. There's another uh, gas system, the rifle length, which would be somewhere out here, and obviously that would require the bullet to travel even further. So first we can see that as the hammer drops and the firing pin ignites the primer, which you know, ignites the gunpowder, which starts to create pressure, uh, as all that's happening, this one uh, is going to is going to allow its gas to escape and allow the operation of the bolt uh, where this one is going to spend a little bit more time even though it's just a fraction of a second it's going to take a little bit more time before that gas comes back and starts to operate its uh, bolt carrier and operate the machine so uh, we can see that that's going to be a difference and this one is going to cycle differently than this one it's going to be a difference in perceived recoil so as you're shooting the firearm and as it recoils, it's going to be, it's not going to be better or worse, it's just going to be a little different in this uh, rifle. And some people uh, feel that the gas system, or giving the bullet a little bit more time to build pressure, gives it a little bit more pressure to send back, which makes it a little bit more reliable. If that's the case or not, we're probably going to be debating for a long time, but that's one of the reasons someone might choose the mid-length over the carbine length. Uh, most rifles you're going to find are in the carbine length, but more and more of them are being made in this mid-length. And there's a lot more to cover there, of course, but we're just briefly touching on it here. Another difference between these two rifles is the type of handguard. This one we call a free-floating handguard, while this one is a standard. So what does that mean? This one, the standard, the Colt 6920, has this delta ring which moves forward and backwards. And as we move back on the delta ring, we see we can pull the handguard lower end of the handguard off. This is important on a Colt or on a military style rifle because if they were going to attach an under barrel grenade launcher, you would need to remove half of your handguard and it would come in and attach in this little section here. And that's why they call this the M4 uh, style profile barrel. But uh, that's one of the reasons why the handguard comes off. But it's also identical to the top handguard. So as far as resupply or repair, it's just one part to buy and it fills the role of both sides of the handguard. We can see that the handguard is shielded with these aluminum things and those are heat shields because obviously the barrel is going to uh, have friction against that bullet as it pushes the, as the expanding gases pushes the, push the bullet down the barrel. This barrel is going to become hot and if you're holding the firearm up here obviously that's going to be an issue. So the uh, uh, heat shields basically keep that heat and rise it up hopefully through these holes up here where typically your hand's not there. So let's take a look at the insides of this standard handguard setup. Now this is just the uh, pivoting sling swivel so 
This part is just for the sling. Uh, we'll move it out of the way here. So we've got the, we're looking at the bottom of the rifle now. Here's the magazine well. Here's the barrel. We've got this delta ring, which we talked about moves. Inside of there, that thing that looks like a gear, is the barrel nut. And that's the thing that's holding the barrel to the upper receiver. The delta ring is on the outside of that barrel nut. Let's keep in mind these parts when we compare them to this other rifle. Uh, but mainly the, the big difference here is that these hand guards are going to be retained up here by what we call the gas block, or in this case, the front post, which is both the gas block at the bottom with the front sight at the top. So it serves two, this, this part of the AR serves two purposes. It allows the rifle to operate in its semi-auto configuration by being the gas block and the place for the gas tube to attach, but it's also our front sight. It also holds the front of the handguard in place, so we can see these places where the handguard's gonna push into, and then the back is held by the spring tension of the delta ring. So you can pretty much see that when I pull back on the delta ring and slide that handguard up into place and allow the delta ring to lock it into place. So it's not that there's pressure applied from here to here, it's just that this dimension is exact and this handguard fits right in there. And on a Colt, it fits in there with no wiggle, no jiggle, nothing. It's completely solid. But it's not so solid that it's pushing. So in other words, this dimension is 100% accurate so that this handguard fills it in. If it was a little bit too long, then we'd have the potential of the barrel being screwed to the upper receiver. And then this handguard, if it was too long, and obviously this is dramatic, it might bow the barrel. It might put pressure on the bottom of the barrel to push your barrel up. And although it's not, you know, the pressure of this spring isn't going to bend steel, but it can apply forces which are just going to be something you fight all the time. And on a, on a poorly built AR, one that is poor dimensions or a lot of dimensional shift where there's some amount of uh, play in all their dimensions, if all those tolerances build up in the wrong way, you could get, again, a rifle that's under stress, which is something you don't want. Not all rifles are built as nice as Colts, so that can be an issue on less expensive rifles. But let's take a look at the alternative to a standard handguard, and that's what we call a free float. Now there's a lot of different styles of free float. Many people you talk to will suggest that Troy are some of the best. They definitely listen to their uh, shooters, they listen to their customers, and they respond with new designs and new approaches to the same uh, solutions to the same uh, situations. So let's take a look at this one in comparison. First off, one of the big differences is we have a sight that looks a lot different than that front post style. So let's take a look at how this sight, or what jobs this sight is doing. It's literally just a sight. It flips up, it flips down into the rail, you don't need it, and it flips back up. So it does one job, it's a sight. So how are they moving their gas? If we look inside the holes there, that tan thing there is called the low pro gas block. On this one, we can see that there's a set screw there. We just can't see the other set screw, but there's two set screws that hold that gas block to the barrel. Then there's a gas tube that's gonna transfer the pressure back. Let's see if we can't aim this straight at the camera and take another look. And there we can see that gas block Stra you know, wrapped around the barrel, and uh, I can't point to it, but it's, you know, it's in here. Now a big difference with this A2 style front sight compared to a low pro is the low profile gas block is attached with two set screws. So basically two screws come through the gas block, apply pressure to the barrel, and uh, through that tension, uh, keep it in place. Now this is a crucial part for the operation of the AR, so if those screws came loose, or if something shifted it, there's not much to stop it. Sometimes they drew little divots in the bottom of the barrel for those set screws to fit into, but not always. The difference on an A2 front post is that uh, it's installed onto the barrel, then a hole is drilled uh, through both the front sight block and the, a piece of the barrel. So now you've got a pin going through a notch in the barrel this way. There's just no way for it to, to turn this way to yaw, and there's no way for it to go forward and backwards much more mechanically strong than this style. So a lot of people would take a standard front post and shave it down in order to change out their hand guards as opposed to taking this off completely and using set screws on another piece. Uh, it's up to you what you want to do, but a lot of people feel this is a lot stronger than the set screws. 
So let's look a look, take a look at how the free float barrel works. So we've talked about the delta ring is on the outside of the barrel nut. On this setup, there's still a barrel nut that attaches the barrel to the upper receiver. However, that barrel nut is typically a different shape. It's a proprietary barrel nut, which operates the same. It does the same as far as holding the barrel to the receiver, but it's going to be shaped differently so that this free float handguard can attach itself to the barrel nut. And that's what happens here. I'm not sure on this Troy if it uses the standard uh, barrel, uh, barrel nut or not. Uh, but here and there, the free float rails are typically going to attach to the barrel nut, which is directly attached to your upper receiver. So now instead of being attached like a standard handguard, both here at the upper receiver and up at your gas block, this one is only attached at the back. So the barrel on this firearm is attached to its barrel nut, and aside from that barrel nut, there's nothing else like, from this rifle that's attached to this barrel. Although it looks like it's completely touching, there's, uh, we looked at it, there's nothing in there that touches the barrel until you get all the way back here. Difference again on this one, it's attached here at the barrel, not the same way. However, up here, the hand guards come back and touch the barrel. And as we talked about, that could be an issue on a poorly built or a, um, an AR that's made out of inferior parts. I think we've addressed a lot of the differences and some of the similarities between these two. Obviously, with a machine like the AR-15, which has multiple options for literally every single part on the unit, uh, we could go on forever and ever. So this has become a fairly long video. And again, we'd like to thank our friends at Tucson Guns uh, for giving us these two excellent examples of AR-15s to compare and contrast and hopefully give some more information on a purchase decision out there. Uh, we always encourage you to leave comments ask questions, and always, thank you for watching. The guys and gals at gunwebsite.com encourage you to take a CCW course every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thanks for watching gunwebsites.com.